Almeida is a, a man that can be counted upon, and I'm sure that this uh, new era of Peter in the health ministry, he knows what a man's like, he knows our struggles, he knows the heart of a man, and uh, Peter, I really welcome you here, and I'm thankful that you're in a good position where you can do something for men. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, my Tom. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to say a couple of things. Firstly, a uh, welcome and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to be here ever so briefly. Uh, my background was in uh, the Queensland Police Force uh, for a long time, and I came into this parliament about 12 years ago, so I've seen the best and the worst that society has to offer, and many of you would have been in a similar life experience over the course of your working lives or exposure to the good and bad that the human race has to offer otherwise. I saw some great injustices uh, for men during that period of time and I saw some great injustices when we were working with uh, Barry Williams through uh, the look at the child support agency and system in this parliament which was in the 2001 parliament and some change took place uh, but a lot hasn't changed and I think there are a lot of amazing people around the country, including obviously people in this room and my good friend Watto here, who have been on a campaign um, to get a better deal uh, for men and for their families, most importantly, for the connections to be re-established in many families and within some cultures between men and their children in particular, and it shouldn't be a topic in our country that we're afraid to speak about. So my portfolio now uh, is in health and also sport while well, I've had to take sport, mate. Um, uh, so I get to... It's also when you know, okay. someone to hold your bag. All right, well, Kiralee doesn't want to go to the footy on yeah, the uh, So, look, it's, it's an enormous uh, honour uh, to be a minister in Tony Everett's government. I think we have the capacity to, um, to right some of the wrongs and to work with people, including uh, with your interests, uh, to make for a better country. So um, I'm happy to... I'm, I'm probably more... Uh, more willing or more wanting to take uh, questions or pieces of advice that you might have than, uh, than to uh, rattle on too much more. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the causes that, uh, that you represent. And uh, what well, nice to see you again. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. You're existing groups there, and uh, there's, a, there's, there's specific areas. Give you a good time to hear a moment from each group, yeah. say, that uh, mm -hmm. the highlight. Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you. So, uh, Warwick, pardon me for sticking my nose in here. This is Warwick, the man that's made it happen. Yeah. But I know the man who's the leader of our group that's here. If you sit, come and set the pace, then the other couple of groups can quickly formulate the main guts of what you're on about, so Peter can hear it. Then we might have a couple of questions from the floor. Yeah. At the time. Okay. Well, Minister, thank you very much for uh, for coming today. I guess. Um, we just want to get across a couple of key messages uh, that uh, we seem to have a fair bit of consensus about. There is a national male health policy that was released uh, back in 2010 uh, by the then Labor government, um, and there was very little, mo very little money attached to the implementation of that policy, and uh, we would love to be able to see that dusted off by this new government, and uh, for there to be uh, a priority given to seeing the strategies that have been suggested in that policy uh, document um, made, uh, I guess, start to make a, a real difference in our nation. So that's one great thing we'd love to see happen. The other thing is that um, um, we really need to see federal government taking the lead in coordinating um, the initiatives that will seek to address some of the disadvantages in health uh, that men experience right across the board from boyhood to manhood and um, we'd love to see an office of men or maybe a minister for men or that kind of, uh, of credence given to that particular portfolio um, unless we can see government taking the lead in this we're going to be coming back time and time again um, until something really does happen and hopefully it'll be this government that makes it happen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, next group, next group. Uh, yes, Simon.
tell us all. He's actually telling everybody as well as himself. So we're all finding out what's happening. So, yeah, so I can't get us on the radio. Grab the Well, the discussions we had were really aimed and kind of addressed the points that we feel there's a very small but extreme agenda by, I guess, the, the far or the, 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 the feminist movement that has resulted in a lot of changes that have only represented the most extreme occurrences of, of say, um, of, of a child. So whether that's the family law court or the child support agency or any other part of government, there's, there's been a very powerful lobby for a very small part of the activities that have actually resulted in that. So what we were, we were discussing is, we didn't quite get the answer, because I think it's more than a five minute conversation, but we were discussing how we can bring that, um, those agendas and the, the actual outcomes of the agencies back to a more neutral perspective. So instead of representing one small minority uh, of extreme cases that doesn't reflect uh, the average situation, what we can do to actually bring that balance back and we feel that an inquiry into the child support agency is was a number one priority, um, being the fact that, that there's just case after case where we hear of, of injustices uh, in the family law court as well because of the evolution of different priorities and different interests and highly complex legislation. But also I think it's, it, it's important for government um, to provide that leadership, but also maybe acknowledge the fact that as an up seemingly underrepresented sector of society being men, even though we are approximately 50% in numbers, we obviously feel underrepresented in, in a lot of government departments, whether that's the family court, child support agency, or even institutes like the police force. So I guess uh, the, third, the third point was I'd, I'd look to the government for leadership to say, we may not get as, as many votes and we may have to go out on a limb to achieve this balance, but we are leaders and we represent our people and therefore we shouldn't just acknowledge a very extreme and small agenda. We should uh, address the balance, and the balance is for men and for women, and with that, if that's an office for men, if whatever it is, but leadership from various departments and general acknowledgement that we have to lead for everyone in this country, women and men, and that will be for the benefit of everyone. We've got Fred and uh, we've got over to Mal, Mal is it? Mal. Carol. Carol. Oh, Carol. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, no, Carol. Yeah. Words. yeah, Carol, you can come and say a few words. Just for your information, uh, Minister Carolyn also was the one at the library. If you take a copy of this back with you, mm -hmm. that uh, we'll uh, release this so you can take this with you. And this is uh, courtesy of Carolyn, who's actually put this study together. But over you, Carolyn. Thank you. So. Our group was looking at the education of boys and also about fatherhood and we believe that it goes down to the core of it starts with the boy and the boy becomes a good man. So we know that there was a parliamentary report on boys in schools, I don't know if it's like a different department than yours, but uh, that was in 2006. So our first point is we would like to know what was the What's the evolutional process that has come out of that? Because the developments in neuroscience um, and education around the world has identified that in fact, and this is going to be rocket science here, boys are different than girls. <laughs> <laughs> this is new news, people. <laughs> so, interestingly, what we wonder about is how can we start amending the educational curriculum so we actually start building that into the process? And I mean, it feels like we're going backwards in time a little bit, doesn't it? That we have to be able to educate a girl. This is what it means to be a girl and success for a girl. And this is what it's a boy. And it does. We, I suppose, what we want to all ensure is that we don't end up with a homogenised no gender. So uh, the other thing that we were just talking quite a lot about is that boys actually need to be trained and guided up to becoming a good man. And that, particularly with boys, needs to be learning good life skills. And so what we would love to start working out is how can we start developing 
into our national curriculum good life skills for our boys so that we start developing a better nation where we have a nation of good men. Thank you. Okay. We'd love to do responses and I'll try to come up with questions up to you. Okay, sure. Well, I'll just start uh, just, just with the point about uh, the health system and, and the approach uh, to the the new government, uh, we have already started some discussions in the primary care space in particular, so our GPs, our nurses, our pharmacists, uh, the allied health professionals, uh, specialist care as well, about ways in which we can do things more efficiently in health and get better contact. One of the things that blokes aren't good at is going to see their doctors and there's uh, particular reasons for that. Um, we have to try and break down some of those barriers, but provide, in doing so, provide some support around particular programs. So around prostate, around bowel, around some of the other cancers where we've got relatively good survival rates for argument's sake, we need to have a better engagement and an earlier engagement. In the area of mental health, uh, we've got a program which is targeting at the moment uh, juveniles, if you like, between the age of 12 to 25. And we know that with mental health, that 75% of mental health issues manifest themselves in people under the age of 25. And for too long, the boys in particular, haven't been able to get access to those services. And I think we are on the cusp of something quite significant in this space because there's been a lot of investment uh, that's been made at the 2010 election. We made a commitment of about a billion and a half dollars into the previous government's credit they rolled out some of that uh, commitment and we want to build on that. So I think, depending on which disease group you're talking about, there are ways in which we can provide specific, uh, specific uh, support. Now, that leads into the second point, which is about leadership and whether it's within the health portfolio or talking about ways in which people interact in the court systems or uh, in the criminal justice system or the uh, child support agency or other government agencies, I really think that comes down to uh, to a cultural change and that has to take place from the top. Uh, departments, uh, particularly at a federal level, um, you know, have lots of faults, but one of the things that they do, that they, do, do uh, that they can facilitate is a change in direction under a new government. And they will listen, they'll adopt uh, a lot of what we've said in opposition. Already they come to you in the opening weeks of government uh, talking about your agenda looking at uh, what it is that we've had to say and I think that uh, if you look at the key personnel within the Abbott government um, in health and education uh, in Attorney General I don't think you've got people there to fear I think these are people who are open to very very strong messages that you're conveying and I think those conversations <coughs> should start now particularly around the curriculum which was the third point that was made uh, it involves as many of these areas do not just the Commonwealth, but the state governments as well. But at the moment, uh, you know, I think we've got a pretty good relationship with most of the state and territory governments as well. Uh, so there's an opportunity for a conversation to be struck, for action to commence. And I think there is a desire, a willingness uh, from the Prime Minister down uh, for us to address some of these inequities and not a bias that we may have seen vested in a lifetime of work of some of those who were replaced in September, uh, on September 7 in the election. So, I'm very open to discussions about how we can better engage men and boys in particular so that we can provide them with the health services uh, because, not, as I say, we focus on the mental health issue which is important but it's in the prevention space otherwise uh, where we can talk about sedentary lifestyle, where we can talk about their role in the family unit. The engagement with a general practitioner is something that uh, is meaningful to a lot of Australians but for many others they don't have that relationship that perhaps us a generation or two ago did. Uh, and that can be a very important and a positive influence on men and young boys as well. So there are a number of ways that we can help and we probably can't do it justice uh, just in a couple of minutes here. Um, but I'm very pleased to be able to work with uh, with you, with you Warwick uh, um, and the other leaders here in whatever way we can. I'm happy to take a couple of questions. I've just got a meeting waiting and I've got to be in the chamber at four months, so please. I, I just had, um because so many of these issues we're talking about are around gender, and this is the first time I've walked these halls, so I, I, there may be a lot going on I don't know about. But um, it, it seems to me that there's an opportunity for 
a new government to kind of put this whole gender thing to bed, to take it out of the this camp and that camp and kind of form some kind of council on gender which has representation from men as well as representation for women, some kind of maybe advisory body or or council or, or some kind of body that can actually, you know, deal with these issues at a kind of top level and consult to the government on that. I was just wondering what you thought of that idea. Well, look, my, my first, I mean, starting with first principles, so uh, I think government should be minimised wherever possible and I think government should get out of the way of uh, Australians in particular so people can get on with their lives. So I'm very much a small government person. Uh, in my portfolio, I have uh, a Department of Health. In addition to that, I have 21 outside agencies. Uh, I have reams and reams of uh, statutory and non-statutory advisory bodies, uh, and I could consult to death, uh, really, to be honest. Uh, from between now and whenever I leave this office, uh, I, could, I could meet every day um, with different advisory groups and the rest of it. I think, though, uh, what matters most is, uh, you know, the, the spirit that burns within. I mean, if people have a desire to address these injustices, they should be blind to gender. I mean, the, the, what was going on with the child support agency and the family court system when we addressed it in 2001, there was a desire by the Prime Minister of the day to try and lift the lid on what was a hotbed of really a movement that was not in the country's best interest. Um, we didn't need an advisory group. There were plenty of people, including in this room, who advocated for that change to take place or a spotlight to shine on that problem. Uh, we applied ourselves to it and we had supported the leadership at the time. My sense is that Tony Abbott will provide that same leadership, that if there is a problem that is identified, we don't need advisory groups, we need to make sure that ministers have the desire, the internal desire, to make sure that they can address that inequity. Uh, and if those inequities are brought to our, our attention, um, I promise you I will act on them. Uh, and I, I am convinced of the need for us to pay attention, to try and get some balance back into the equation. There's a lot that we do that's fantastic in uh, in female health issues, um, but in one way, there is uh, it has been at the expense of some of the effort um, in the way in which we administer support to men who might need uh, cancer nurses, for argument's sake. Um, so it's not an either-or option in my mind. I think there is an inequity, there's an imbalance, and it should be addressed, and we should apply ourselves to it. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, look, I just wanted to alleviate it a little bit. Uh, I was one of the men's health and as it was a rock and who bought in the men's health policy and I was, there was men out there suffering prostrate and unless they got private help they got a, a long waiting list to get in and a lot of men are dying through this. Now I've got a case where a person was told that he'd be six months waiting down the line because he didn't have private help. And he said, I did have private help, so they got him in within a week. Also, in my other hat, I wear parents and our partners. We're, between the two of us, we've got 39,000 members at the moment. I was asked to, at a conference, to contact Tanya Fluberson, the previous uh, health minister, and tell them about the way that their children were being treated too on the same thing. If they had private help, they could get their kids in hospital. They couldn't, they could be waiting nine, 12 months down the line. The, the, all I got from Tanya Fugger Thomas is, oh look, we don't want to go into that. And but I was asking since the 12th of March, 2012, and up to when they lost government, she still would not listen, did not want to hear. Whether it was just her part or not. So what I'm saying is, and there's a lot of dads within the child support scheme who were paying child support and now the CSA is saying to them on many occasions, drop your private help and pay more child support. Well, that's a terrible thing to say to them because if they get sick, they go off work, they can't work. You know, they can't pay any child support then. And I try to convince human services that for ages and ages, but it's like talking to a brick wall. I did try to get an appointment with uh, Julia Gillard and uh, her boyfriend Tim Matheson liked me with some men's health policy and he told me to he'd get me an appointment. 
I got an email then from some men's shed saying, you know, you've got to tell us all about it, that we'll decide whether you get the point or not. So I just emailed back and told them about it. Or <laughs> I was just waiting on you people. Your government has, look, you were put in with a mandate. And, and a lot of, I know a lot of people within this room got their organisations and got, we, well, mine did, I'll be straight up front. My organisation got out, parents of our partners all around Australia are known partners and grandparents. And we told people, if you want change, vote a new government in because you're not going to get on this one because we're so sick of. But they're just the things I wanted to tell you. You know, I've been in a child support scheme since day one, but I'm getting that why I can't support it anymore no because I've just dealt with too many deaths lately, you know, and that's what I'd like to come and talk to you about, self minister. Okay, I'll be happy, happy to meet with you. I'm sorry I haven't got more time, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I wish you all the very best.